Hello and welcome to Higher Ed Live, the live weekly web show all about the world of higher education. We're all about professional development, digital development, professional empowerment, all about bringing you the best shows we can to make your world a little bit better, a little bit brighter, and kind of ramp up your work day. That's right, it is 2012, the first show of the year. I'm your host, Seth O'Dell, and I am so glad you guys decided to join us for this conversation. We're talking all about ed tech in 2012, looking back, looking forward, where we're we at, where we're we going. Really exciting guest, really exciting topic. Guys, I'm glad you're here to kick off the year with Higher Ed Live. It is a big year, and uh, we're going to dive right in. So we start each and every show with a little thank you to the sponsors that make this program possible. So thank you very much to Integral, the creators of the Schools app on Facebook, a private Facebook community to boost enrollment and retention. Check out their latest white paper on how schools are preparing for the mobile revolution in 2012. I'm sure mobile's coming up today, guys. It's a pretty cool study that they have going on, so always great when there's more information available. Check that out when you can. Tweet just went out with the link. Coming up next, Omni Update, also a wonderful sponsor, the leading web content management system, CMS provider for higher education. The company's web CMS OU campus is secure, scalable, with great tools and features, deployment flexibility, and an awesome user community. In fact, it was the highest ranked CMS in a customer satisfaction 2010 EDU Guru survey. So if you need a CMS, don't do anything before you check out Omni Update. Definitely make sure that happens. But they are not alone. We are also sponsored by the one and only guys over at Scavenger. Scavenger is a Google-funded mobile game about going places, doing challenges, and earning points. Learn how your institution gets started with Scavenger as well, and read case studies and interviews from the 400 colleges and universities they've already worked with. Check all that out at scavengeru.com. Guys, thank you so much for joining us. We're going to dive right in. We're going to make some stuff happen. We're going to make some magic today. It's 2012. It's time for a great show. We're starting with the weekly five, five stories from around the world of higher education worth reading, starring, or promise yourself, I'm going to get back and read this because this is something I should know about. So let's kick off with a personal story. This one's hitting a little close to home, guys. Higher Ed Live, very proud to announce we are growing once again. We've introduced Admissions Live. It's the latest addition to the Higher Ed family. It is going to be live every Tuesday, 7 p.m. Eastern Time, hosted by the one and only Ashley Hennigan from RIT, covering innovation and everything you want to know about the admission space in higher ed. Sent the announcement out this week, got a great response. We're really excited, guys. We are trying to grow and bring you all the best opportunities we can to provide and share information, host the dialogues that matter to you guys most. So as always, let us know what you want to see here, what you want from us. We are here to work for you. We are very happy to keep growing and making it a big year all the way around. Now, moving on with the weekly five, we also have an announcement that came out a little before the holidays about MIT launching MITx. It's a major online learning initiative, and, well, we're going to be talking all about it, I'm sure, on today's program. But just read this article if you haven't seen it yet. It's a big shift. As always, MIT is on the forefront of making some big changes. What do those big changes mean for the rest of us? Have they really just turned the entire model on its head? Well, if you haven't seen it yet, read that article. Check it out while you're watching the show, because we're going to break that down in a whole lot more coming up in just a minute. Moving on, really interesting article. California's community colleges may become more intentional about rationing access to education. That's right. At the time we're talking about making education more accessible, the California community college systems are facing a serious situation where they are excluding a whopping 140,000 students between 2009 and 2010 that got excluded from actually going because why? Budgets are getting cut. They don't have the same room as before. So the question is, if you're going to exclude that many students from community colleges, who are you going to exclude and why? And this is a really interesting conversation. A lot of data. It's something that everybody should be reading. It's really Really an interesting and an unfortunate trend, uh, but one worth finding out because people are being excluded. The question is who, why, what are the policies in place? It's something worth following if you haven't been already. Uh, and then another big interesting story just coming out. Georgia lawmakers say that their university system wants to merge eight campuses into four. I don't know about you, but is this the trend for 2012? This could be something else we're seeing. A lot of schools getting more resourceful with the limited resources that they have. They're actually shifting. They want to take eight campuses, possibly merge them into four to reduce budget cuts. We saw the SUNY system trying to share chancellors. A lot of interesting things going on, guys. You're going to see a lot more of this, I bet. And you know what? Better keep an eye on it. And lastly, Weekly 5, it's a story that slipped out before the holidays. Great blog post by the one and only Dave Olson at Mobile and Higher Ed, all about how to sync web page events with embedded YouTube videos. And I know, like, what does that really mean? Check out his post. It's really, really cool. You can embed a YouTube video and then essentially set it so whenever someone is watching a video at a certain point on your page, all these other animations and things can happen on your website. It's pretty cool. It's a neat way to make video more engaging. But more importantly than that, Dave went way above and beyond and wrote a very detailed tutorial. So he did all the hard work for us. All we got to do is read a blog post. So let's do that. And Well, we got a little music playing right now. I'm not quite sure why. 
Sorry about that. That's what happens with a live show. Music just starts playing. Maybe it's just uh, that time of year. Anyways, that's the Weekly Five. Moving on to the unsolicited shout out of the week where I shout any person, place, thing, or idea that I want. Why? Because I can. It's my show. Get your own show. You can shout stuff out too. That's how easy it is. This, day, this week, unsolicited shout out goes out to a very simple thing. Possibilities and opportunity. This is 2012, guys. It's a big year, a lot of opportunities. Spent some time over the holidays with my family, kind of sitting back, thinking about where things are going, both in my own personal career, the industry I choose to work in, an industry I have a lot of passion for. And at the end of the day, I found I was still very optimistic. I was full of hope. And uh, I think the question I have is, what are you going to do with it this year? I'm asking myself that. So possibility gets into the shout out because ultimately there's a lot of factors outside of us, but there's also a lot inside of us as well. A lot of this is up to us. We can make a difference, and that's pretty cool. So that is the unsolicited shout out of the week. Let's dive right into today's programming. We're talking all about ed tech trends in 2012. And uh, before I do bring on today's guest, I want to say we're having a few little Skype issues. So potentially it could be a little wild ride, but that's why you guys like the live show, right? Because you never know what's going to happen and how often I'm going to get sit here looking awkward by myself uh, as all the technology around me crumbles. So you never know what's going to happen. It's a live show, but please allow me to welcome a guest I'm very excited to have on the show. I wanted to have her on for a while. It's the one and only Audrey Waters, who's EdTech Journal, open source, open education <laughs> advocate. You probably know her from Hack Education, an awesome, awesome blog. She's over at Inside Higher Ed now, too. She's I know she's writing pretty much everywhere these days. Um, Audrey, <laughs> welcome to the show. I'm so happy to have you on. Thank you. I'm so stoked to be here. This is going to be a great way to kick off uh, the year. So yeah, it absolutely is. It's a it's a great I think a conversation to have. Uh, you know, you wrote a great series of posts. And I actually plugged them a couple times uh, in the, the December on Higher Ed Live, kind of recapping what were the top trends and stories of 2011. You kind of started hinting at what do you saw coming up in 2012, and that's when, you know, it just made sense. Let's get you on here. Let's have this broader conversation. What's happened and where are we going? Because ed tech was kind of, I mean, a big buzz in 2011 in general. There seemed to be a lot of more conversations, a lot of focus on it. And then I think the question is, well, where is it leading us? What's going to happen next? So, you know, I'm super excited. Uh, if you're ready to dive in, I'm going to start just shooting out Let's a whole lot it. of questions. Awesome. Let's Guys, if you're it. watching, you know the rules. Put the hashtag out. I'll show your tweet on the screen. I'll ask your questions. This is your show, Higher Ed Live. Use the hashtag and we'll make it happen. So uh, just, you know, to start right off with the first one, we talked about uh, in the Weekly Five, MITx, the announcement from MIT that they're essentially going to open up this whole online experience where you can come and learn more or less for free in an automated virtual learning environment. What, what do you see in that? That seems like a huge opportunity, huge move from them. Uh, it's a pretty big deal. Is this the future? Is this where things are moving? Or is this MIT once again being kind of 10 years ahead of other people and experimenting in new uh, models for learning? No, I, I am particularly intrigued by, by this. I mean, and you're right, ten, you know, it, this was, last year was the 10-year anniversary of MIT OpenCourseWare. And so the university really has been at the forefront of thinking about what it means to take content from courses and put it online and make it openly licensed, openly accessible for anybody to use. Um, but then last year, uh, Stanford started its... Um, Oh, um, it's online engineering classes, which at the end of those classes, anyone could anyone could sign up and take them, whether or not you are a Stanford student or not. Um, you got a letter from the professor saying that you'd successfully completed them, and uh, and MIT seems to be taking sort of j m tapping into that and moving that a little bit uh, forward as well with this notion of getting some sort of certification. Um, they say it's it's not going to say MIT going to say MITx, um, but some sort of certification to that you can use to demonstrate that you're, you've successfully completed this sort of informal learning process. And I think that as, you know, as we are able to learn more online, or there's more of these online informal DIY learning opportunities. I think that, the, I think that this is something that I predict actually we're going to see several other universities do that this year. Offer offer some sort of some sort of letter or, or piece of paper, not a diploma, that says you've successfully completed our open education courseware. I, I totally agree. I think this is definitely the beginning of something big. There's going to be other schools following. The one thing I find so interesting about this is that it does still come down to credentialing. Like, how are you going to actually assess and prove someone has this information? Because 
Well, there's a lot of reasons why people go to college. I mean, one of the biggest things I obviously talked about is the fact that it, it, it can change your life. You People that have bachelor's degrees do make significantly more money than people that don't. So the question is, is someone that has a certificate going to be viewed the same way from employers? So there's a lot of like interesting uncertainty with where this moves. That If we're not talking about issuing a bachelor's degree necessarily in this environment, what does a certificate mean? Or what does badges mean? What do these different elements mean? Uh, how they're going to be viewed? It's kind of, uh, I think, very uncertain, but um, I mean, certainly exciting. Well, I mean, I think that I mean, I think that the, I should we should have a little asterisk here next to this because this is Stanford University and MIT, right? And so, I I actually have a hard time imagining that anybody who had a letter from um, uh, from Sebastian Thrun or Peter Norvig that said that they'd taken that um, AI class, nobody is going to say, oh, it's not really you're not really a Stanford student. I mean, I think that I think that those those institutions already have a certain amount of cachet that I'm not sure I'm not sure every I'm not sure every university would be able to offer that that sort of alternative credentialing the way that MIT and, and Stanford uh, do. But I do think if you were an, if you were having um, someone apply for a job and they said that they had um, this alternative credential from from Stanford and MIT, I think I think employers would take that seriously. I really do. Would they take it seriously from a, a no like a no name college in the middle of you know in the middle of I don't want to pick on anybody's <laughs> geographic region here, but I'm not sure. And I, and I, it wouldn't surprise me if the other universities that we see doing this year are are Ivy League schools or you know well named schools like that. Mm -hmm. It's it's not going to be. I'll pick on my home state. It's not going to be University of Wyoming, right? Mm -hmm. It'll be Harvard. Yeah, that, that, that's a really good, interesting point. Uh, the other point it brings up, too, is I think, you know, how do you assess in an online environment? Uh, I mean, like, the Stanford example is a great one in that class. I mean, when you're having thousands of students, how are you actually grading and making sure these students are actually performing at the level they want? Because in theory, whenever you get, whether it's a certification or a degree, essentially it's saying this is the stamp that, like, yes, you've learned this amount. We believe you have these skills. So we are entering a place where it, it's going to be interesting. Are you going to have, you know, completely 100% automated systems. So now all of a sudden someone's being assessed in theory and it's entirely automated. There's no human component to it at all. Uh, that, that, while interesting and certainly scalable, I think raises a lot of interesting red flags and kind of maybe some concerns too. Yeah. I mean, and I think that this is worth pointing out too, is that, you know, the, these were engineering classes at Stanford and the, the, the folks behind the MIT X initiative are also a, that's also the AI professor. So this is very much about developing an artificial intelligence. I mean, one of my, I should say, one of my predictions for the year was the rise of the robot grader. And I do think that we will see these sorts of systems be developed that are going to have this artificial intelligence component in terms of assessment, but as as a person who studied, you know, literature and writing, I don't like. Does every subject fit into the AI framework? I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure if I'm not sure if we could think about sort of other topics outside of engineering sort of easily easily becoming mechanized that way. It yeah. sort of scares me. I agree. It's very, very interesting. I mean, granted, we're obviously very early on, and I think that's why these concerns are certainly coming up so so rapidly, but it's going to be interesting to see. I mean, it brings up, too, we're talking about a lot of uh, credentialing certificates. It brings up, too, the, the other trend that I found in 2011, which, which I know you've written about, it, is the trend of badges, where not yes. only, I mean, certificates have been around for a while. There's a lot of students that use that, but now we're talking about a totally, perhaps, an online-based badge system very different. I mean, what are you seeing with badges? Where do you see that going uh, in 2012 and, and even beyond? I, I'm actually pretty, I'm really interested by the badging system. And I, and I must say, I think that it works best. And it's, it's actually no surprise that Mozilla um, is, is sort of leading the charge on this, because I think it actually works best, or, or it's most easily, it's sort of most obvious how it'll work in the technology sector, right? So you have a student who graduates with, you can have a student who has a, a CS degree, a computer science degree, and they don't know JavaScript, right? They don't know MongoDB. They don't know any of the new technologies, partially because everything changes so quickly. And so the technology industry needs a way to make sure that they have sort of, the, that the programmers that they're hiring, like if you say, I want to hire a Ruby on Rails developer, that the people that the people that you're hiring have Ruby on Rails knowledge, and I'm not sure that our current the current degree system 
the current degree system doesn't really show that. Um, and so I think that the badging works really well in technology. And you can see that actually in Stack Overflow, which is an online, sort of an online Q&A site in which people sort of get they sort of get graded by their, it's, it's almost like, you know, it's like this Reddit model too, where the community is grading you and highlight. I think that, I think that badging is going to become very popular in the technology industry. Will it make, will it transfer to other people? I don't know. I mean, I, I did a story um, right before the holidays and I was trying to find any human resources person, any HR person who would go on record and say, yes, badges would count. Um, because they would say, oh, the, you know, the, you have that legal language that says degree or equivalent. Um, but I couldn't get any HR person who either knew what badges were or were really interested in saying, yeah, we like the badging system. Yeah. So it's got a long road. Ahead. Absolutely. There's a lot of questions coming about where, where, is, where are things heading, where is the next road. But I think that, I mean, what are your thoughts on weighing all this out, including, you know, the gamification idea? You know, do you see one over the other? Or do you see, you know, the next few years being almost like a feeling out process where we see, what what makes the most sense? See, that, that's actually um the when when Mozilla um and particularly when the um, when the DML competition announced the bat the Open Badges project, a lot of people were like badges uh, because I think that we've I think that people were seeing the the Open Badges project project as gamification, and I don't think that that's I don't think that that's what's going on here. I think it's just an unfortunate unfortunately we're used to getting four square badges. And I think we sh we shouldn't conflate getting a badge on Foursquare or you know earning earning a badge on oh maybe we should at earning an ed badge on Xbox games I don't know maybe that will go down <laughs> maybe that should go on your resume but I think that I'm not sure that the badging system is gamification in this case now there are lots of other education companies that are excited about badges and that makes me puke for other reasons but. <laughs> <laughs> it is a, a bit of a, I don't know, it's getting a little bit of an interesting, messy space. It's, it's going to be a big, big uh, movement. I'm sure it'll be kind of ebbing and flowing in a lot of directions. It'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Um, one of the big moves... Well, can I just add one thing? Please. I should say that the people who are, I think that, um, that a lot of government agencies right now are really interested in the Mozilla Badge Project as well. NASA, the Department mm -hmm. of Education, the Department of, of Labor. And so this isn't just sort of... Mozilla randomly coming up with this idea that no one else cares about except for, you know, sort of the open source geeks of the world. I mean, they do have some pretty powerful players who are um, behind them in supporting this effort. Mm -hmm. no, that, that's, a, that's a definitely a very fair point. Now, I want to move on to a really interesting subject that I found in 2011, something you've written about a lot too, which is L the LMS world. There's been a whole lot of talk, you know, obviously Blackboard is like the giant, and there's <laughs> been all these people popping up, but it's been this... I mean, I don't even know where to start with this. There's so many like smaller startups, people trying to come up and shake up the LMS game and change things. And, and I'm curious, is this actually happening? Or is the market share actually being taken? Is change being made? Is this just a lot of people trying to all play the same game? I, I mean, where where is this moving? Where does it come from? I'm, I'm even still confused. I haven't seen hard numbers to see where the growth really is. So what is your thoughts on, on that entire space? What, what Actually, what fascinates me about the LMS space is that in some ways it's the most... If for 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 anybody who's been in college uh, as a student or as an instructor for the past 15 years and you ask them what is the biggest technological pain in your ass over the time that you were in college they'll say the LMS so it's a pain point for students it's a pain point for instructors it's a pain point for administrators it's a pain point for IT um, professionals everybody hates the LMS and so it seems sort of obvious that if people say oh i'm going to i'm going to fix education with my new technology tool that the lms is, seems like the 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 no brainer that being said i'm actually not that excited about the lms as a space i think that um in some ways i think that both in both in terms of technologically a lot of lms tools remind me of like windows 98 um actually that's that's actually being very generous um that, um, but I think that I think that the I think we're starting to recognize more about the open web and getting students to publish things, um, publishing publishing things online that aren't in these walled gardens. And I'm not sure that the LMS philosophically sort of 
um, encourages that. The LMS seems like an old, an old model of thinking about knowledge that just happened to have an internet connection to it. Very interesting. I, I definitely see where you're coming from with that. It, it's, it's just been so interesting. There's so many people trying to come out and kill Blackboard. And the interesting thing I found too is um, there's a lot of talk, but I mean, I'm not hearing a lot of stories of people saying, uh, we're pulling off a Blackboard and we're going to something totally, totally different. It's, uh, I'm curious, of all industries, I know our industry to be incredibly committed to doing what we did last year. And I'm sure it's a whole lot easier to renew a contract, even if it's a huge six-figure contract, than to start from scratch and start doing something over. And I, I think that's a huge hurdle in the LMS space alone, is simply just getting the institutional buy-in uh, to actually make that kind of a change. No, I mean, and I think that that's what makes some of these startups really interesting. And just uh, just at the beginning of the year, CourseKit, which is another one of these upstart um, new folks to the scene, um, they raised $5 million. So this puts their total funding at over $6 million. Um, and they're actually not selling their product to institutions. So they're selling directly to, I should say, selling loosely. Their their um, their their customers are professors themselves, and so rather than sort of chasing the institutional contract, which even with six million dollars in funding is virtually impossible to compete with with uh, with black with the blackboards of the world, they're 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 hoping that professors will be the ones to adopt it. But I still have, I mean, I'm still uncertain about that model too, partially because. You know, I think any time that you you ask a professor to sort of do more, more clerical work, right? So you've got all of your students' information in one system, say Blackboard, but we want you to use this other, better, nicer system, but you have to enter in all your other data there. And it's, I'm just not sure that the, the tech, like the, the, the professors who are tech savvy are probably going to have already figured out other ways of other ways of using online tools, and I'm just not sure that that's the sort of target crowd for the LMS. I think that's a very good point. I'm really curious about that as an entry point for them to bring it into market as well. So uh, I guess 2012 will be a good year to see how that moves forward and how that goes. Um, so looking back on 2011, some uh, one organization has made some big changes, obviously. This is general, but also higher ed focused. I'm curious what your thoughts are on Google in general with what Google's been going on. I mean, two big stories were both the Chromebook and then Google+. Plus. Uh, you know, they've been doing a lot with Google Apps for Education, too. They're up to, like, 67 of the top 100, according to them. I mean, they've been making some major pushes to get schools onto Google Apps. You know, where, what are your thoughts on Google? What, was, what were some victories in 2011, and where do you see uh, them moving in the education space? I actually think that Google has done a really good job with the Google Apps for Education. Um, and I think that it, it's, again, you know, coming back to our earlier point of making these institutional switches is really hard. And when you have an institutional infrastructure that is sort of bought into a, an old, an older sort of set of technology tools, I think you, fi you find resistance um, to change. Uh, that being said, I think Google has really... Um, has really makes a strong case for why the cloud makes sense for universities, why the tools, you know, why the hosted hosted email, cloud hosted email, why Google Docs makes sense economically for universities because they're free, um, but they also make sense for, for students. Um, so I think that Google Apps for Education is a big win. Google Plus, I don't know. I, I mean, I wouldn't say it's a failure, um, but I wouldn't say it's, I'm not, I'm not sure what's going on with Google Plus. I have tens of thousands of followers on Google Plus, and I have there are some great conversations that happen there. But does it? It doesn't feel like a Facebook killer. It doesn't. It, I mean, I feel like right now I'm I'm replicating all of my like I tweet something and then I post it to Facebook and then I post it to Google Plus, and that I don't know how sustainable that sort of duplicating my social efforts is going to be. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. Uh, and speaking, I agree. At this point, it's, it, it's too early to see how that's going to impact education. But what about the Chromebook? Because that was when Google brought out the Chromebook, you know, the, the, the laptop that only works online, that's entirely web-based. You know, they were really like, this is going to be big in classrooms. They had a huge education push. I haven't seen that at all. But, I mean, maybe I just haven't gotten the updates. Have you, what are your thoughts on where Google Chromebook is? Oh, I, I, it's gone. I predict it's gone. Wow. I, I mean, okay. Okay. Well, I should say perhaps if 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 Google's if Google's uh, patterns hold true, Google will ignore the Chromebook in 2012 and then cancel it early in 2013. Maybe that's a better prediction. But I, I don't. I 
And I should say that I like the Chromebook. I, I have a Chromebook. I use it as my backup computer with the knowledge that if something happened to my wonderful MacBook that I have, I have, a, I have another backup computer and all my stuff is stored in the cloud because I am a Google Apps user. Um, but I think that they price them too highly. I think that it's, I mean, it's really just a, it's really just a dummy terminal and the initial pricing was, was just too high. And I'm, I'm just not sure that the, that I'm not sure that the web is ready. That's sad. But it, it is, it, but it's an interesting uh, and, and a fair point. And I mean, they were looking to get a lot of institutions, I think, to do large scale buy-ins. And there's a lot of people in that space now too, trying to get the large enterprise accounts where people are buying 5,000 at a time. And I don't know. I, I just think that for a lot of educational institutions in this kind of a budget crunch, you're going to have to really show how that saves them money rather than cost them money to get people to put up that kind of cash. Uh, I'm not seeing that trend, even though there's a lot of people, like there's a lot of tablet makers that are coming out that are trying to be in classroom tablet makers. It's an interesting space. Uh, but speaking of both Google moving to their competitor and tablets moving to the competitor, let's talk about Apple um, and the iPad and uh, this, there's this rumor about some big announcement coming. What's up with Apple and education? Uh, in uh, 2012. Well, this is this is this is the wonderful thing about working as a technology journalist is is that the Apple the Apple rumor mill makes gives us so much material to write about. Even when we have no idea, we 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 manage to pontificate endlessly about what Apple could possibly maybe perhaps do. And so the speculation right now is. Um, is that Apple sometime this month is going to be making a, an announcement um, and announcing that it's going to uh, make the move into textbooks, right? And of course, if you read the Walter Isaacson uh, biography of Steve Jobs, you know that that was, per that was supposedly that one of the last things that Steve Jobs was working on, this notion of um, sort of destroying the, the, the textbook publishing industry the same way perhaps that he destroyed the record industry. Um, so I mean that, you know, I, I mean that nicely. But um, I'm not sure. I just don't, having read the Isaacson biography, I didn't actually see what was written there as being a, a, a particularly interesting or innovative solution. Um, his idea was to sort of buy a bunch of, or hire a bunch of people to write textbooks and then give them away for free. Um, but that's certainly not the model that they used in order to sort of to, to, to defeat the record industry. It's not like Apple hired a bunch of musicians to sort of make music. Um, so, so I'm not sure, I'm not sure what I, I'm not sure what, what we're going to see happen. That, you know, that's a very good point. And then also if they're going to get into the, the, you know, the textbook rental business, you know, that space is obviously getting pretty full of people already. I mean, Chegg had an amazing year this year with a lot of acquisitions. They're doing mm -hmm. a lot in the rental space. I mean, and a, a lot of success, they're diversifying across the board. They're really kind of an education focused. And I, I am curious yeah, if they could enter this space you know, there are companies that focus on this exclusively that work in education. How would Apple be received if they want to come in and tell education how to handle textbooks, but then also run off and still be a technology company and be an entertainment company and everything else? I'm curious if there's a trust level there, although their brand is clearly very trusted, but it'd be well, very interesting you know, to see. I think I think that, that Apple may or may not be trusted. I think that actually a lot of folks now a lot of the record industry, I think the movie industry and perhaps the publishing industry see Apple as the protector of DRM restricted um, content. Um, and I think right now the bad guy is Amazon, not the bad guy for those industries, for, particularly for the publishing industry. And so if, if you were a textbook publisher and you had to choose between the future according to Jeff Bezos or the future according to Steve Jobs, I'm not, sh I think that's, I think that the Apple machine might look like a more appealing alternative. Um, and so, and, and Amazon is actually quite weak in the textbook space, I think. Um, com I mean, certainly compared to, they have, they have a rental program, but um, their, their hardware is, you could, you could never, you could never um, interact with a digital textbook on a Kindle the, the way you can with an iPad. Well, and that brings up the, the big point that I think when people talk about the ebook industry, I mean, realistically, ebooks. Okay, I, some people get mad when I say this. Ebooks are just glorified PDFs, and it bothers me because there's great technology out there. There's Vook is an option. Uh, Purdue University has their great studio by Purdue. It's like in-house developers. They developed a thing called Jetpacks, where it's like yes. custom information tied together, which is awesome. I mean, I have to think that it's 2012. We can move beyond ebooks as just text on digital paper. 
Well, see, and this is one of the things that I, why I think that the textbook, um, I actually think that the big disruption to the textbook industry isn't digitizing them, it's actually destroying it all together. Because one of the, th you know, unlike, you know, unlike sort of uh, a, a novel, right? A novel, you want the whole novel. A novel, you really do want like the PDF, perhaps, if you're going to digitize it. But a textbook doesn't have that clear sort of beginning, middle, and end the way the way other kinds of books do. It has been pieced together with different sections, different units, different diagrams. And so once you have the technological capability to sort of take all those pieces apart, why the hell would you put them back together again and charge some, I mean, well, if you're a publisher, the answer is obvious, but why the hell would you put something back together again and charge someone $200 for it when they really just want a few of the pieces and not not that whole bloated, monstrous, expensive thing. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And that's why I think, I mean, whatever the future model is, it makes sense to me that it's going to be some kind of Spotify RDO model where you're paying like a monthly rental, but you have access to everything. And then it's like on demand, you know, just like Netflix streaming, it's like search. It's essentially, I could see paying for like an online digital library that's more or less mm -hmm. every textbook from certain publishers. But Whatever the future is, I hope it's more than 2011 because I didn't see enough that really excited me, at least in this space. Well, and, you know, I mean, and could could that model work in an iTunes model, right, where chapters are not like the 99 cent chapter model? Mm -hmm. And then you have, I don't know, who the textbook alternative to Pink Floyd would be that we like, <laughs> you cannot just have one chapter. If you take only one chapter, it destroys the integrity of Dark Side of the Moon. But, I mean, I don't know. I, and, I, and I have to think, too, that, you know, one of my other concerns about this these are like the, the, the concerns that I have over rumors is that, you know, we've seen great, we've seen great forward motion in terms of open educational resources. And if there's one thing you can say about Apple, it is not open, right? They're not, the technology under the hood is not open. They're, they're about, they're not about the open web. They really are about closed off proprietary tools. They're great tools. I love them. I'm, I'm a user, but I'm I'm not sure that that's necessarily the best way forward, particularly since we've seen um, the the growth of OER. Yeah, I I absolutely agree. That's a very very good point. I'll be curious to follow what announcement comes if it does and what the reaction is. Um, moving from the iPad smaller, uh, what what about mobile learning? That was something that we talked that's been talked a lot about in the past year. Um, but again, it's not very organized at this point. I think is an easy way to put it. Um, I mean, it's a tool some people use. Where do you see both mobile learning and just mobile usage in general? Because clearly. I mean, the phones are everywhere, you know, people are using them, but it does still seem like there's a, a bit of a, a divide between most uh, delivery of education and, you know, these kind of tools that we all have in our pockets. I still think that, I mean, I, I, I think that we, that mobile, m mobile is going to be a big, a big thing, partially because I think we have really reached ubiquitous cell phone penetration in this country, right? Everybody has a cell phone. I mean, and almost everybody um, even even kids have cell phones, and the, the, the increasingly we're seeing people with smartphones as well. And so I do think that we're going to have to we're going to you know we're going to start demanding for both work and, and school and pleasure and entertainment and television that we're able to access and do everything on our phone. Um, and I mean on our phone. I don't mean on our iPad. I mean on our phone that we that we that we want to that we would do on a desktop PC. And I think that that has really exciting potential for school um, because it is a lot easier to lug around your phone. Everyone has their fo your phone in their pocket. Um, it's much easier than lugging around um, you know the textbooks. Clearly, um, but I think it, it, it acts gives people access to the library, for example. Um, in, in new ways. Yeah, I, I definitely do agree. Uh, got a little bit of a glitch. You look frozen on me, but I think you're still there. So we're going to keep talking. Um, <laughs> yeah, I can still hear you. We did talk about cell phones in the classroom uh, earlier uh, on Higher Ed Live, too, with, with a, a Google certified instructor. Some interesting stuff. But talk about cell phones. Quickly, what about text messaging? Because I know that there's some interesting data that's just coming out um, that I'm curious about, that text messaging may be in decline, that maybe people aren't texting as much as we thought they were. Um, I don't know. Do, do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, I, I don't know if texting, how we're, I think texting fits more into facilitating people's ability to educate themselves, helping people stay on tasks, doing things like that. I'm not sure I see, you know, texting, asking a friend. I mean, the, our person we had on the show did have a good example of, you know, letting students text their parents or friends with questions in class, which he had mm -hmm. some success stories with. But I mean, do you see anything with text messaging in 2012 or anything interesting in that space? 
Um, this is another example where I think sometimes the, the technology, like the technology press tends to sort of get ahead of itself. And because we all live, um, and I, when I say we, um, you know, we technology journalists, we have all the gadgets, right? And we, um, and I think that we assume that everyone else lives in a world that, of smartphones and of, you know, of ubiquitous 3G access. And, and I think that as such, for many of us, text messaging does seem like an outmoded, expensive, silly way to communicate when you could, you could send someone a direct message on Twitter, you could send someone a message on Facebook. Um, but I do still think that text messaging really is the one of the most important messaging systems that we have right now, um, particularly for people who don't have, um, who, who don't have smartphones. And, we're, and I mean that globally, right? I mean, it's, you know, it's all well and good to think about what, you know, what the kids in, in Silicon Valley are doing. But globally, I do think that the world is sending text messages. Will that change? Maybe. Um, is it dead? No, not close. Awesome. Yeah, I def definitely agree with that. I think, you know, there's so interesting uses of cell phones. I mean, back a few years ago, uh, I worked, used to work at UCLA, and even then those stories of, you know, UCLA researchers t finding ways to use cell phones in third world countries to take blood samples. I mean, the power is there in your pocket. Um, that being said, though, you're right. Journalists, sometimes people get ahead of themselves with, with things, thinking our old, in our own world with that. So I just wanted to ask one last one about mobile, which is augmented reality. This has been on, like, this year's hot item for, like, four or five years now, it seems. And every year I'd never fail to see anything really pop up that, like, okay, that's augmented reality actually being useful and used. Um, any thoughts on that? It just seems like every year that's on everybody's list for going to be big, and then every year it just kind of fizzles out. Yeah, I mean, I... I think that I think that we will probably it's a bit to me it's a bit like QR codes. I think that by the time and because I'm I'm not a fan of QR codes for this for a similar sort of reason is because I feel like once we sort of once we recognize once or once sort of the majority of people recognize that the infant that they can ac access another layer of information because of their phone, um, I think that the technology will have um, will have gone to such a place that I'm not sure we kind of I'm not sure it'll look like augmented reality or QR codes do now. Um, I love the I, I love the idea of having having some sort of system that. Does expose his other layers of data around us, but will it be augmented reality um, in the way in which it's sort of like you show your phone and you snap a picture and you add something to it that way? I don't know. I mean, I think it would probably be um, perhaps be more akin of you know push notifications on your phone or some sort of location-based thing. Right now, I, I think augmented augmented reality still seems really gimmicky to me. But you're right; it's always on the list. Coming soon. Will be hot eventually, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, we'll keep an eye on it. Um, you know, so moving just to a couple of very quick, broad, a broad question. You cover a lot, but first off, if anyone out there hasn't been to hackeducation.com, mate, get over there. It is by far one of my top three education blogs, so I read it daily. Um, but you cover a lot of companies, and you're one of the places that introduces me to a lot of new startups, new folks coming out. Any just thoughts looking back on 2011, looking forward to 2012? Any big winners from last year? Any specific companies, organizations you think should be on everybody's radar as maybe they're going to have a big breakout year this year? Uh, is there anybody that you really like or that stands out? Um, I well, you know, despite what I just said about the web not being ready in Chromebooks, I actually am pretty excited about any company, any education company that is thinking about making an HTML5 web app as opposed to a native app, um, because I I think that once the bring your own device, the BYOD, um, which is something I think school, you know, colleges have already been dealing with that because students. Students have been responsible for providing their own technology at, at university, but I think that you know I think that we have to we have to make sure that these apps that we're developing this this educational apps can be accessed whether you're on a Windows machine or whether you're on an Apple machine, whether you have an Android or an Apple phone. And so I'm excited about anybody who's thinking through thinking through the implications of that and building tools that are accessible across different devices. So I'm, I'm hopeful for what I'm really hopeful for for web apps. I think that in terms of 2012, any anybody who is able to use data, data driven and adaptive in the in their press materials will probably have a good year. I think 
um, adaptive learning startups, data, data-driven startups are going to be hot. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I'll take it even just a, a leap beyond a little bit and just say, yeah, anyone that can tie data into proven results in this space in general, well, especially in the social media space at least, there's a lot of companies that are trying to do a lot of cool things, and we're just now starting to see where social media can actually be you know, numerically tied to certain goals uh, and certain, you know, whether it's student retention, student success, things like that. I think that's going to be an interesting uh, undertone for 2012 is when companies have started to be able to come out and say, listen, we have data that proves X, Y, or Z, and these are the reasons why you exist. Read your mission statement, and we can prove we can back that up. Because uh, a lot of these companies start, they don't have the data yet, obviously, and a lot of them have been around. So I think, I think maybe we'll see some numbers this year. No, and I think that that's, you know, I think that a lot of the adaptive learning, a lot of the adaptive learning uh, companies have um, have their history more in sort of test prep or um, sort of like if you think of like the Newtons and the Grockets of the world, their their lineage is in test prep. And that doesn't always translate into what happens in most university classrooms, right? Or, or, or not necessarily, I mean, there aren't a lot of, hopefully, there aren't a lot of multiple choice questions um, in your senior level class. Maybe there are. Um, but so I th one of the companies I'm interested in is Everfi, who have for a number of years now provided um, class online classes for schools that talk about um, that they're often for freshmen and freshmen or during freshman orientation that talk about um, behavior in terms of drinking, binge drinking, um, sexuality, safety, things like that. The more social, the, the sort of the, the, the things that don't actually get taught in the classroom per se, but that are very much part of the education you get on as, as a university student. And they're actually starting to make the move into adaptive learning. And I think that that's an indication that we're going to start looking at um, data and metrics that aren't necessarily just associated with getting an answer right or wrong on a test. And that's an, to me, that's really interesting because we need to sort of unpack what happens in terms of learning, teaching and learning on campus. Um, and, I, and I don't think that just looking at the standardized test score is sufficient. I, I definitely agree with that. I'm excited to see where that path goes. Uh, you know, hopefully we see some big movement this year. I think it's it's definitely possible. Taking one bigger step back, I'm curious, you know, we're talking a lot about all these different elements of ed tech over the course of this past, you know, 40, 45 minutes. Uh, it, looking at the ed tech field itself, I mean, the past year seems to have been a year that's gotten a lot of buzz. There's been a lot of organizations popping up. Uh, obviously, we've, we covered it um, before last year, but that was a big topic. It's in almost all of our episodes. Ed Surge came out, which is a great weekly email list. Uh, if you guys aren't following Ed Surge, check it out. It hits your inbox. A lot of content, but worth browsing through every week. Um, where do you see the conversation going? Because I'll just go out on a little bit of a limb, and I've said this before, but um, everybody loves Khan Academy, and like that's the only thing I've found that a lot of the mainstream media wants to talk about. Like you know, your big national newspapers and your big organizations, they just want to talk about how you know, Salcon put videos on YouTube, and that's the future of online learning and future of technology. And it's, but now we're seeing a lot of these more ground swell organizations kind of popping up and having these nitty gritty detailed conversations that I think need to happen for us to get from A to B to C to D. Um, where do you see the conversation going about ed tech in general? Where do you see people looking at this kind of niche within the industry? Because it certainly seems to be getting a lot more attention, uh, at least in the see, past year. This is one of the things that like, really pisses me off to no end actually about the conversations around education technology because I find so frequently that we can that um, we and I mean that in term, we I mean journalists and I mean um, entrepreneurs and educators and, and parents and students we talk about technology or education technology and we don't talk about teaching and learning and so I'm, I'm always surprised how far down these conversations we can we can go before someone asks about learning. I, I mean, it, it, like, it really boggles my mind. And, and that's, the, that's the thing, I think, with all of this interest in the learning management system. Oh, it has learning in the, oh, there we go, it has learning in the L. But I think that there's really not a lot about, there's really not a lot about how, how can technology change the way we learn? We, we miss that conversation. And, I, and so, in some ways, I feel like we have to do a much better job of, of asking critical questions about how these new tools change things, change things for us for better or for worse. And I think that, um, although I would say that the rise of con the consumer web and the mobile phones and, you know, the, the sort of the Apple ecosystem and third party developers has been really exciting for helping break open what was a hard nut to crack in terms of ed 
of ed tech startups. I would say that if we apply the same metrics to ed tech startups that we use to assess um, a consumer web tool, we we are screwed because you know that's that's the sort of thing that where you get excited saying Khan Academy has you know four million page views per month. So what? I mean, that's I mean, is that it? Like clicking, you know, clicking on a I mean, I know you have a YouTube channel too, but clicking on a YouTube channel is like so what? You know, so what a hundred thousand people have signed up for Code Academy? Like, can we ask, are people learning to code? No? Ah, well, there you go. So I mean, I'm just I'm just worried that and I'm really worried that investors who tend to actually be grossly ignorant about uh, teaching and learning. Um, I think that they're looking at a lot of the wrong metrics and supporting supporting things that are easily uh, sort of have some of those numbers that they can bandy around and actually aren't that interesting at all in terms of changing, uh, you know, change or in improving, improving education. Wow, I could not agree more. That was awesome. That was like a moment right there. I hope everybody watching was paying attention because at least for me, that was awesome. Uh, and exactly why I was so happy to have you on the show because I could cannot agree more. Uh, and I really hope that there is, I don't know, I really, I hope there's a shift kind of back to that. Realistically, it's fundamentals. Why are we here? What are the goals? I am a little nervous and curious too whether or not we're going to see that. Um, it's funny because, you know, just this past week, NPR had a, had a, had a story about physics professors ditching the lecture like that this was somehow shocking to people that lectures aren't the best way to learn physics like duh you know actually hands-on experimentation wins every time um and so i'm always amazed why i mean back to khan academy i'm, I'm amazed at how how much people really enjoy um the content there which is actually just a textbook that sort of a textbook explanation that's lecture it's like it's like an animated lecture i mean it's i mean it's free and it's openly licensed and there's a lot of it yay um but and it's I getting four million page views right so it must be awesome. exactly what are we i mean the question is what are we really judging success and all this stuff with absolutely and i do think that as an industry we may not be judging on the right things because you look at every article about the Khan Academy announced. It is about oh, this many views, this many, you know, it is the traffic and what they're seeing, and, and there's a lot less discussion about the actual end results. How many people are we actually educating? And I, I think, I mean, beyond 2012, that's going to be the real shift. We, there's a big, there's a lot of pushes in online learning, for instance, too. It's something we we didn't get to. We'll probably have to wait for a whole other show to talk all about the online learning realm. You know, the for profits kind of dip this year. Some nonprofits, including you know, I work at SNHU, making some big strides into this space, making some great progress. All these things go on. But at the end of the day, the question is, you know, are we educating more people and are they actually able to elevate their lives and kind of, you know, have a better life because of this education, be, you know, smarter, stronger, go off and do great things, contribute back to their community, to the economy, everything else. Is that happening? Because at the end of the day, if it's not, that was supposed to be the goal from the get-go. So. Well, and I actually think, I mean, I actually think that we are at a crisis. I mean, we are at a crisis moment for higher ed in particular, right? Because some of the mission for higher ed is education, but I think that we see that there are these competing forces between those who see higher ed about preparing students for jobs. So it's like job training or career training. And those who see higher ed as being this four year period of your life where you get to sort of learn about sort of like the, the liberal arts education. And I'm not sure, I'm, I'm not sure that we sort of reconciled, reconciled what, what a higher education degree means. Um, and then you add to that the student loan thing and you add to that the monstrosity of college athletics and you add to that online learning and the accreditation thing. I mean, I think that, I think that it's gonna be, I mean, it's exciting time for, for, um, for higher ed, but I think that there's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, there's a lot of upheaval happening. And I'm not sure that folks are going to like what it looks like at the, I'm not sure I'm going to look like what it looks like at the end, but you know, who yeah. the hell am I? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I totally agree. And, and it comes back to something I mentioned even in the weekly five about the California community colleges, that the reality is that, you know, as a nation, I mean, obviously the show is primarily U.S. based, so we do talk about other things, but the U.S. has dropped from first to, I guess, 11th or 12th most educated, depending how you calculate graduation rates. 
you know, and, and the fact that there are people that want to go to college right now that can't, and either they can't get in because their state systems or the community colleges are restricting access, or they can't afford it. And at the end of the day, I mean, that's what my hope. My hope has always been, I hope to see the string between all the things we talked about today and access to, so that people that want education, they want this for themselves, can get it, and they can get it in an affordable way that makes sense for them and their lives. Uh, because there's a that's a big bump and a huge crisis, and one that I haven't seen a lot of people solve yet. I mean, especially I mean, considering you know the president you know comes out who you know I was a big supporter of says 2020 we're going to be the number one most educated country in the world, and and I turn around and say I haven't seen you do a thing in the past year that makes me believe you're actually committed to that goal in any possible way. Uh, so I hope we see something more in 2012 to make a shift to actually letting people get educated. Uh, it kind of this, the basis of why we're here. I predict that uh, Arnie Duncan will get canned this year. That's I'll go on record and say that. I, I think well, I, because I think I mean I think I actually do think for a lot of for a lot of folks that the that Obama's education policy, particularly at the K through twelve level, has been shockingly awful. And I think that if 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 Barack Obama wants to be reelected, he needs to he needs to win back the support of of teachers. And right now I don't think that'll happen. And I don't think that'll happen with Arne Duncan in office. So I'm predicting a Matt, da either Matt Damon, perhaps Matt Damon is the new secretary of education. That would do it. Don't you think that that could do it? I mean, if, if anyone saw the YouTube video where he totally verbally spanked that cameraman who was insulting <laughs> teachers, you know, I don't know. I'm a big fan of Matt Damon, you know, water.org, you know, I'm a big fan of water causes, <laughs> But uh, I don't know. That could be an Obama move. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that will. But, but I. But no, I. No, actually, you just made I, it. Bold prediction made by you on the record. I totally heard <laughs> it. I'm on the record. <laughs> Well, uh, listen, Audrey, I don't even know where to, to start to recap this. This has been an awesome, awesome past 45 minutes, 50 minutes conversation. Um, you know, before we sign off, because this has been a big talk of where we're going, I feel like we've actually covered a lot. This is You kept up with my speed. You actually made me kind of get winded. I'm very impressed. Uh, I tend to work fast. What are last thoughts that you want to leave people with today? Well, I mean, I, I think that this, you know, I think that actually when we think about it, the, the education is really one of the most important things and we have to get this right, right? Like it doesn't, you know, you know, talking earlier, I mentioned the, 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 the comparison with web technology tools. Like I don't really give a shit if you, oh, excuse me, I don't really care if you use Instagram or Hipstamatic, right? It doesn't matter. Like I think they make lousy pictures either way. You add some filters, whatever. But when it comes to making educational software, right, when it comes to educational systems like it matters like it really matters it's important that we get this right and so i think that people need to people need to be really critical of of what we're doing and where we're going i cannot agree more uh i am incredibly excited about the next year and the only other thing i can say before i let you go is you have to promise me you'll come back on because this has been one of Anytime. the most fun shows i've had yet <laughs> and an awesome way to kick off 2012 so thank you so much for coming on the show yeah thanks for having me seth this has been great awesome thank you so much and guys listen please make sure to check out hackeducation.com and check out higheredlive.com too. We are growing, we're expanding and uh, please let me know what you want to see from us this year. I'm talking about kind of trying some new models. Just before the show, I decided I want to pitch an idea to you guys about doing broader panel-based discussions, bringing on multiple guests at the same time and debating topics. Uh, usually it's just you know me to a guest. What do you guys think? Tweet us, let me know right now. Do you want to see heated conversations, picking topics that are kind of really controversial, putting people face-to-face -face on the show, two, three, four people, and letting us go at it? What do you want from us in 2012? Because we're here to kind of push this dialogue and try and be a resource for you. Um, but wow. Thank you guys for tuning in. Please make sure to check HighRedLive.com to see a calendar of all our upcoming shows. It'll be updated a lot starting next week. We're going to have upwards of three shows a week. We're kind of growing. We're excited. What matters to you this year? That's what I want to know. Thank you guys once again. I'm Seth O'Dell. This has been Higher Ed Live. Get ready for a whole full year of this stuff, guys, because I'm not slowing down, and now you aren't either. So you guys take care. I will see you all next week. Wow.